good evening. Um, I haven't been in, up here for a really long time. I actually came up here to the launch party of Esquire magazine. I went on to edit and uh, it was um, amazing to be up here. But anyway, we didn't, they didn't have that clear bit of glass. So actually, that's quite um, ill-making, I think. But here we are to talk about food. And actually, I've slightly changed the title. I will get to why it's making us fat. But I also want to talk a bit about food. Oh, thank you. And the city. Um, Cities we think of, I think if people say, what's a city? They'll say it's about buildings, it's about people, it's about skyscrapers, it's about museums, culture, all that kind of thing. But actually, if you go back to the history of cities, they were completely defined by food. They were defined by how much food you could get into that city and therefore how big the population could be. Um, if you just take London, um, this is not an accurate figure because nobody actually knows it. But we think, and I think it's pretty accurate, that there are about 30 million meals are served in the capital every single day. And if you thought of yourself, I mean, one of the things I'm going to come on to is like why governments have no control over the food industry. But if you thought of suddenly that system stopping and you rang up number 10 and said, there's a crisis, provide 30 million meals tomorrow. Now, it's completely impossible. It's one of the most complicated curious and weird and, I would say, rather dysfunctional systems in the world. Um, it is efficient because, yes, we're not starving. Well, most of us are. We're not getting fed. Is it healthy? Well, no, it's not healthy at all. And actually, cities, in a way, have an awful lot to do with why the food system has become so unhealthy. So if we go back a really, really, really long way, uh, like 10,000 years, back to being a hunter-gatherer, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you had absolutely no use for a city. You were constantly on the move looking for food. In fact, looking for food was what you spent your whole time doing. Um, you would make tiny little settlements and then you'd move on. And that was the state of affairs until, in the Fertile Crescent, round about 10,000 years ago, the great discovery of grain, and grain could be dried, and therefore it could be stored. And out of grain came the first very primitive kind of bread, which was sort of mushy and apparently pretty disgusting. And we know that people in those days had absolutely appalling teeth. So whether the grain had something to do with it, I don't know. But it was this phenomenal game changer in the history of the world, because suddenly you didn't all have to look for food. It was fine that people who were smarter could go and be builders and architects and politicians and rulers. and. From there, everything, everything completely changed. And those cities that were in Palestine started to grow, grew throughout the world. Rome became the first city that topped a million. Rome was also, though they didn't know it, the inventor of the food miles. Rome um, used to get oysters. For some bizarre reason, they got oysters from the UK. Um, I'm not sure how they got them there, but they did. Rome, of course, was a city that had a river and had the sea. And both of those things were absolutely critical in terms of a, how could a city grow. Um, so let's think about London and what London was prior to round about the 1830s and the Industrial Revolution, which is the other great big game changer, which we'll come on to in a minute. But this city was just about food. I mean, Matt Green will probably tell you about bear baiting and all sorts of things. I've heard him tell wonderful stories about what happens in this city. But my feeling is that you'd walk around this city and you'd be conscious of the food. You would have cattle walking through it. You'd have pigs in back gardens. You'd have Blackfriars Bridge, where I used to work beside it. We still had the rights to walk geese across the bridge. Never happened, but it is still there. In London Bridge, um, you can walk sheep across London Bridge. There's, these old statutes are still there. And the names, Cheapside, Bread Street, they are part of what this city was. You'd have been in no illusion where food came from. I mean, there would have been carts coming up carrying vegetables from the country, there'd been ships coming in, bringing in stuff, whether it was from abroad or from other places. Um, we would have had pigs in the back garden, the big markets like Billingsgate and Smithfield, um, Covent Garden, they were huge, they were powerful. Most of the people who ran the vegetable market in Covent Garden, they kept like the early sweets in the Savoy and then they'd go back to their mansions in Essex. They were kings of the city. Cattle used to walk and 
some cattle used to walk all the way from Scotland to the London market. Apparently, they lost so much weight by the time they got here, 100 pounds per cow. They would then be fattened up in Islington, um, which was the pasture area. And also, they put them near breweries because then they could use all the spent grain to fatten them up a bit more. Um, milk was often a really big problem. London, at its peak, had a herd of 20,000 cows, which were living in all sorts of different places and parks. And the milkmaids apparently used to get up at three in the morning and they would cart the milk around in pails. It was very unhygienic, um, but it was, it was what we had. So you were never in doubt where your food came from and a city could only be as big as it could supply food to the people who lived in it because there was no point in getting so big. You certainly could not have had a city, couldn't have had this city, could certainly not have had like Mexico City or something like that. But industrialization changed that incredibly quickly. Suddenly you had a railway, so you could speed cars into the middle of the city. You could sort of take away the fact that there were animals around. You could move vegetables in, you had canning, you then had refrigeration and almost without anyone realising, what happened was that food, which was something raw and fresh and sort of wild and real, and that's sort of what nature wanted us to have, suddenly turned into an industrial commodity. And if you walk around a Tesco's or a Sainsbury's or whatever today, there's no sense of where the food came from. And I know it's a kind of cliche, but, um, you know, I meet kids who still say, oh, spaghetti grows on trees and, you know, you, you plant, you do gardening with them and they'll take out a carrot and they'll be amazed that this thing they ate had some connection with the soil. And it, it's kind of mind-boggling and it's happened very, very fast. So that's one of the things that started to slither in the food system. The other big thing, which we get gallop quite a lot up to date, really, into the, about the 1970s, when a whole lot of things came together with the food system. One that was that um, we got feminism, women working, um, mass manufacture became extremely sophisticated, and these two things combined to say that we could stop cooking. In fact, at Spare Rib, we had a slogan, don't cook, don't type and you'll get ahead, girls. Um, in fact, the world took the don't cook bit, I think, very, very, very literally, because all sorts of companies, were, in fact, Marks and Spencer's were one of the first ones, produced the ready meal. And the process of how you prepared food, it wasn't just where food came from. The next big thing that happened was how you prepared food. Suddenly, you didn't have to do that anymore. And it started to move away from us and from the control that we had over it. And so today, you end up with a world where the food system is so dysfunctional now that we have in the world some, whatever it is, six billion people, of which over one and a half billion are now obese, suffering from, starting to suffer from diabetes and all the food-related illnesses, and just over a billion are starving because they don't have enough. And if anyone tries to say that that is an efficient food system, well, it isn't. It's a very bad food system. And going back to what I said at the beginning, we need 30 million meals for London. Well, we're not gonna get it because food now has gone right across the government. There's no one ministry that looks after it. And you could say, actually, it's probably the most important things in our lives. I mean, we can manage with that most things, but if we don't get fed, we don't have anything. And yet, you talk to someone in the Department of Rural for food and rural affairs, and they'll say, oh, we're only concerned with English farmers and the means of production. Department of Health is concerned with this, Department of Education is concerned with this. Nobody can join it together, because actually, what's been so clever about the food manufacturers is they've made it literally too big to fail. And it is much more true of the food system than that statement was ever true of the banks. I mean, food really is something that people can't get round. So, we, the other big thing that happened in the 70s was that the economics of food started to change. As food corporations became much more mechanised, basically, and they, they realised that they could, you know, make ham by mashing up pigs, reconstituting them in shapes that looked a bit like ham and then slicing them down, using illegal workers to work in the factories all hours of the day and night, employing people to work on fields, whatever it is, the food system all around the world has got a lot of this what I would call very dirty practice. 
food suddenly tipped from being round about 30% of the average budget to suddenly being under 10. And that, from a government point of view, was something that absolutely seized on. We've got to keep it this cheap because that way we keep people happy and that way also we can power the consumer revolution. If you were spending 30% of your income just on eating, you couldn't buy a flat screen telly and you couldn't go on holiday to Spain, you couldn't go to Torremolins and a whole lot of things again didn't happen. So all these things kind of coalesced. And we stand now in 2015 and I, I guess that me and people who work in the food industry, we always sort of date it from like, well, sort of 1970, 1980, certainly by 1985, things had really gone on the shift. And what, what is food? <coughs> had sort of again lost its, um, lost its value. Suddenly supermarkets were full of crisps, uh, Pringles, um, sweets, um, stuff that actually if you'd gone back to your grandmother or whatever as the wonderful Michael Poland said, you know, you should never buy anything that your grand with ingredients your grandmother wouldn't recognise. But actually now you go into the supermarket and probably a third to a half of the supermarket is filled with stuff that my grandmother would not have known what it was. This is not food as we know it. This is manufactured stuff. And I think it's really not that much different from, you know, attempting to eat a Primark T-shirt in a lot of ways, because a lot of the stuff has about the same nutritional quality as the Primark T-shirt. In fact, it could actually be the Primark T-shirt might even be better for you than some of this stuff. Um, how am I doing for time? Four minutes, okay. So I want to get to the point of my side. So these, this is the problems I think that we face. There are acute in cities. Kids, are, kids and us are abstracted from it. We've forgotten what food is. We sell food in every single um, chain store, for instance. Top shop sells sweets. They're everywhere. The nation is getting fatter. It costs 30 billion a year, according to a McKinsey report at the end of last year to service what you might call obesity. In other words, actually, to service the food industry. Because for the food industry, as someone has calculated, the obesity, it's not really a gap, because it's about things getting very, very much bigger, but it's uh, the amount people are eating. It's 80 billion a year in America that they are making from the fact that people eat too much. So the incentive for the food industry is to follow the capitalist model, which is to sell more made from cheaper ingredients. And that is, in my view, a total failure of capitalism and a total nightmare. And for a lot of kids and for a lot of adults, they're heading into long, long-term ill health. So when I got this job, we thought one of the things we could do, we do all sorts of things. Sometimes I wonder how far we're getting, but we decided that something we could do was put food back in the city, at least. Um, you know, what, during the war, when in the tower just down there, they used to grow, they had fantastic allotments in the tower. The Tower of London used to grow all the fruit as well for the palaces of London. Well, I've gone the wrong way. So I'm just going to show you some slides of what we did to put food back into the city. And we did a project called Capital Growth, and I spent about a million quid of public money on creating now 2,600 vegetable gardens and we've just got the money from the lottery to put a garden into every school so that kids will get taught where their food comes from and start to understand it. And we've got gardens in the most, oh God, that's me, um, in the most <laughs> extraordinary places, on rooftops, uh, we've got bees, we make stuff. Next week we've got the first ever London Food Awards, so we've got best beer, best sausage, best salad, best cheese that's been made in the city. We support small businesses. And we try to get people to understand that actually food is amazing stuff. Nature gave us something magical. There is nothing more extraordinary than planting a, a runner bean. And then in a matter of a few weeks, the runner bean is up to here. And this one little seed, size of my thumbnail, is producing, you know, three, four, five kilos of extraordinary food. And somehow we've let ourselves believe that actually it's better to have a packet of Pringles. And... If I have any energy left in me, that's what I'm trying to say, that we can change. These bring communities together. That's a great one. I love that. They're in, say, in high rises. They, um, they never get vandalised. Um, we have 180,000 volunteers. Um, and they have a lot of parties. So thank you very much. <laughs>